Hello, welcome to today's video on um, The Emigre. Uh, this is actually one of my favourite poems in the cluster. Um, it covers ideas to do with conflict as well as ideas to do with power, which I think is quite interesting. Um, it's quite modern as well and there's, there's kind of a lot of ways to read it. So I'm going to go through the basic view of it being about a place. Um, some people read it as um, being about different things like... Um, your childhood and that sort of thing but if we go down the route of it being about a place it, it links well with other poems it covers good ideas about conflict but obviously the great thing with poetry is you can read it as you wish um we're gonna be using the four highlighters well i'm gonna be using the four highlighters i always use so we're looking at yellow for words analysis pink for language analysis green for structural analysis and then orange for ideas about power and conflict Remember, when you're analysing a poem, you don't have to cover all of these things, but it's a good way to annotate just so we know if we if we want to look for those um, certain ideas. OK, let's get this out of the way. So uh, the emigre is on page 43 of your anthology. Um, we'll just start with some basic con like context information, which we'll write up here at the top. And then we're going to um, go through and analyse it stanza by stanza. And we'll put some general ideas along the bottom. Um, we'll start with the idea of the emigre. Now, this poem, um, the word an emigre, an emigre is someone. Someone forced to leave their country, normally for political reasons or social reasons now you're gonna probably ask what's the difference or you'll be thinking anyway what's the difference between an emigre and maybe an immigrant or a refugee um they're all kind of different things although similar uh, an emigre is the kind of action of going out of a country leaving a country whereas an immigrant is somebody coming in um so it just depends what perspective you're looking at it from um, and a refugee is obviously someone seeking refuge. Now, a refugee doesn't have choi a choice. Um, and arguably, often, emigres or immigrants don't have a choice either, but there's kind of political uh, borders between those things. But anyway, we'll go straight into a little bit more context, which is that the poem was written in 1993, and it was published in a collection called thinking of skins which i think is quite interesting so it's thinking of different people's perspectives thinking of kind of empathy i guess from carol rumens who's trying to think of you know different people's lives and how they have to live okay i'm going to read the poem and then i'm going to go straight into analyzing it so um <coughs> There once was a country, I left it as a child, but my memory of it is sunlight clear, for it seems I never saw it in that November, which, I am told, comes to the mildest city. The worst news I receive of it cannot break my original view, the bright, filled paperweight. It may be at war, it may be sick with tyrants, but I am branded by an impression of sunlight. The white streets of that city, the graceful slopes glow even clearer, as time rolls its tanks and the frontiers rise between us, close like waves. That child's vocabulary I carried here like a hollow doll opens and spills a grammar. Soon I shall have every coloured molecule of it. It may, it may by now be a lie, banned by the state, but I can't get it off my tongue. It tastes of sunlight. I have no passport, there's no way back at all, but my city comes to me in its own white plain. It lies down in front of me, docile as paper. I comb its hair and love its shining eyes. My city takes me dancing through the city of walls. They accuse me of absence. They circle me. They accuse me of being dark in their free city. My city hides behind me. They mutter death and my shadow falls as evidence of sunlight. Okay, we'll start with green for structure. And we're just going to look at the opening of the poem. So it starts kind of talking about the past, almost um, almost a flashback. 
and it referenced this um it references this place this country um that the person the speaker left when they were younger but they still have a nice clear memory of it And in that sense, the poem becomes quite linear because it starts with kind of the background and then it moves into her view of it. And then it kind of all gets a bit weird when she imagines visiting the uh, city itself. Now, we start with this as well, this personal first person pronoun. That indicates to us that it's quite a personal experience of the speaker. Now, don't get that confused with the writer herself because she wasn't an um an immigrant or em emigrant um so what then happens with that pronoun is it goes from i and then it shifts to they later on in the poem so it's kind of talking about her experience of the place versus how other people see the place we'll come back to that a bit later on what she then says is my memory of it is sunlight clear we're going to talk about this use of sunlight, which hopefully you would have noticed from me reading it, that there's a lot of references um, throughout the poem to sunlight, okay? So you've got it here. I'm just going to underline it because we're going to use that for something else. We've got bright. It also is used here and here which we'll come back to we've got ideas of glowing white streets okay so the whole poem um, uses a semantic field of light essentially but what you'll also notice as I've just done this is that the end of every stanza returns to this idea of sunlight so sit that repetition there so we'll start by just writing something about structure down here it's got regular stanza lengths but there's not a great deal going on with structure the best thing perhaps to re refer to is the repetition of sunlight ends each stanza uh, obviously you wouldn't just mention that you're going to talk about why that is so she always remembers I'm running out of space positives so in this poem as in much of literature the sunlight the brightness is associated with positivity so the fact that she every stanza despite the kind of negative thing she mentions she always returns to sunlight even at the end where it's her shadow is creating sunlight what that tells us is that she's always going to have a positive view of this place no matter what happens to it and the fact she's had to leave it so that's an interesting structural thing but also as i've just gone through we can just touch on it a little bit more by mentioning this semantic field. So, semantic field, remember, a collection of words from a poem which all link to a common theme. So you've got to say what the semantic field is of, it's of light. And then we can just explain it a little bit more than what we've done here. So, associates her, I'm going to call it homeland or a home country. With positivity slash light. Okay. So, it's an interesting thing that we just tracked a couple of things across the whole poem. So we talked about the structure the ending of each stanza, which is one thing. And then we've got this kind of um, use of this semantic field. So sunlight, bright, white, glow, and again, sunlight. Okay, so those are those two things there. Let's carry on tracking through the poem now. So we're just gonna pick out some key language devices. We don't have to analyze every single line. So the next thing we're gonna look at 
is this interesting metaphor here. Now normally if we were in a classroom I'd Google a paperweight and show you images of it, so I've just printed some so we can talk about that. What she says is that the worst news I receive of it cannot break my original view, the bright filled paperweight. So the paperweight is a metaphor for how she sees um, how she sees her memory of her homeland, okay? So a paperweight looks like this, if you've never seen one before. It's annoying because I've got one in my classroom that I would show you if we were doing this at school. Um, they're made of reinforced glass and they're, they're used to hold down um, piles of paper in an office, for example. And they're often filled with little things, often flowers, um, sometimes other things. They're made of reinforced glass and they can't break. So the one that I've got in the classroom, I can just literally throw it on the floor and it won't it won't break. You can throw it really hard and it's just it's it won't essentially break. And the the reason she's using this metaphor is obviously quite interesting and it's a really good quotation to use because it's like three words and there's absolutely loads you can unpick from it. So we'll do it here. What we'll talk about is the we'll start off with bright. So the idea of it being bright is quite obviously links that links to the semantic field we just talked about of light. The idea of it being filled links to her memories so she's got these endless memories and then finally this idea of paperweight is the kind of main part of the metaphor so a paperweight would just list some of the things so can't break holds things down and it's reinforced so what she's saying here with this metaphor is that nothing can change or break her view of her homeland. So no matter what the new government or the new tyrants, which I'll come back to in a second, um, do to her homeland, they can't break how she sees it. It's this strong, this strengthened paperweight. That's how she sees her memory. It's a really interesting metaphor. Um, what we've also got next is she references that her, her homeland maybe at war, maybe sick with tyrants. I'm going to do that in orange for ideas about power and conflicts. This is this kind of covers both power and conflict. And what she's talking about is a, a type of conflict within her homeland, which means that it has a new ruler, a tyrant. So a tyrant, I think we covered this when we talked about Ozymandias, but a tyrant is essentially a bit like a dictator. And we would have actually talked about it as well for Macbeth. It's relevant to all those things. So remember, it's a, a leader who has total control, total power, often rules by fear. This is a hint, therefore, that what's happened in her homeland is, is so bad that they've taken control. Her government have taken control and they are pushing people out and ruling through fear or violence. So that's quite an interesting link there. What we've also got in this... Um, first stanza there's lots in it there's not as much as we go on she talks about being branded by an impression of sunlight okay so we're just gonna put that down here that's again another metaphor because she's not actually branded when it doesn't mean like branded in terms of a brand like a company it means branded like a tattoo for example or perhaps more permanent um, when they use a hot poker to brand animals, uh, like cattle, with numbers, or times in history they've used that to brand certain types of prisoners. Um, obviously, it, when you brand the skin, it becomes permanent. So this idea of her being branded links nicely back to that Brightfield paperweight because it's how she has this permanent sense of um, positivity because it's that sunlight again about her homeland she's branded now branded arguably you could say that that's kind of a, a a painful thing but it's not for her 
it's it's a positive thing it's that they these people these tyrants will never change her view of her homeland um so it's quite an interesting quotation and it's a good one to learn because it's got this idea of sunlight it's the end of a stanza so if you were analyzing that quotation you could talk about structural things as well um not just the metaphor itself okay we're going to move on to the next stanza now um there's not a great deal to say about this because we've already covered this kind of imagery of um of light this semantic field of light something i do want to mention though is um in orange for power and control and conflict it talks about the child's vocabulary that i carried here like a hollow doll there's lots of ways to read this i mean the most the most obvious obvious way to read it is that what she's talking about is her native language and she's saying that the place where she lives now, which obviously is somewhere different because she's had to um, leave her homeland. She sees her native language with that simile of a, like a hollow doll. I always think of this as like the Russian dolls. I should have printed a picture of them. Um, where there's nothing inside or sometimes there's lots of things inside, but eventually there's nothing. They're empty. And what that is, is because in her homeland they have banned her native language so what we've got here is this control and power over language which is quite an interesting idea and, and links to some of the other poems it also links nicely to london and the idea of like peop um, a society being controlled it links to mind forge manacles in london um, the difference here, of course, is that she has no choice but to not use her, her language. It's not mind forged, it's not self inflicted. Whereas in um, London, they're choosing to be restricted, sort of. That's what Blake thinks, anyway. And we go back to this idea of sunlight at the end of stanza two. Now, in the final stanza, it does get a little bit weird, it gets all a bit metaphorical. Um, and um, what Rumens does is she describes almost kind of like a dreamlike state where the speaker imagines her city her home town or city as visiting her um it's a bit strange um and it visits her as like a human entity uh, so there's kind of this personification and then they go to the homeland together it's all it's not really happening Okay, it's just kind of metaphorical or inner mind. Um, but what is interesting about this final stanza is there's lots of personification of the city itself. So there's a few things it does. It lies down in front of her, me. She combs its hair. They go dancing. Doing a lot of highlighting in pink because this is all personification. Um, and then finally which will come back to my city hides behind me. Okay, so what we've got is this like shifting personification. So the personification of the city shows us these kind of different versions of her homeland that she has. Originally, it lies down in front of her, so it's quite um, submissive and she calls it docile. So it's kind of calm, it's not, um, it's not in conflict with her. But what she does though is she combs its hair so she's kind of maternal towards the city it's almost like the city is a daughter and she's brushing its hair she then takes it dancing so it then becomes a friendship and maybe quite a fun kind of relationship with the city so it's showing us this kind of like that the city that she knows and when she sees it as a person it's kind of got all these different versions it's quite multifaceted and has um you know she has different relationships with it that obviously as she's mentioned already no one can affect no one can change now what it ends with um is here in this section here which we're just going to do in orange um for ideas about conflict what happens is she imagines these people kind of trying to take power and take control from from her and from the place so this is probably a link towards the government and the conflict that's happening oh i spelled that wrong <laughs> no tea there um government having control 
slash power not only over the place but over her as well and what ends up happening and I'm just going to put it here is that she ends up basically protecting the city she says my city hides behind me now this is interesting because we get the impression that she would risk her life for the city. So the fact that it hides behind her is kind of an element of sacrificing herself. So she would be willing essentially to die for her homeland. That's why it's a really kind of key quotation. Um, the three kind of most important quotations, you've got that Brightfield paperweight here. You've got the branded by an impression of sunlight, which allows you some good analysis there. And then you've got this one towards the end, which is quite important. What you've also got within this quotation is a little bit of word analysis, because I mentioned at the start that this idea of these personal pronouns, so this one is a possessive pronoun. She's, she's showing that she feels like she has ownership over the place, despite um, what's happened. And what you've then got is it juxtaposes with this, you've got my and me, and then you've got they. And that's the kind of people that now technically are in control, but she sees them as very separate to her. It's her city, it's her homeland, and they don't own it. And in the final line, you've got some lovely juxtaposition. So she talks about her shadow falling, but the shadow becomes evidence of sunlight. Now, she also mentions here she that they accuse her of being dark so they accuse her of being negative or against the state we can assume um so what you've got here is a shadow falls which should be darkness but she sees the shadow and she sees that as evidence of light so it's still a positive place for her even if, even if they're trying to create darkness and they're trying to create shadows she will only see it as a positive place. So the shadow creates the sunlight because as you know, hopefully you know, when you have shadows, it has to, has to be light. Okay, that's the poem in a nutshell in 22 minutes, um, which is quite good for me. The last thing I'm gonna do is just put a little box down here for the key links for this poem. Now I do think this is a really good poem um, for linking to other poems in the cluster. So we have um, the most obvious one, London, because they're both about a particular place, okay? And a, a view of a place, a love of a place, uh, the way that um, the establishment, the government, or some sort of you know, politics is controlling a place. There's lots of links between um, those two. You can also link it to Checking Out My History, which is the next one we're doing. Um, but they are both about your identity, your personal identity, and how your identity is affected by where you're from. Um, so that one's a good link there. It also links well to poems like um, War Photographer and Remains. with the idea of being away from conflict, but still affected by it. And then um, another one you can do is about how a, um, a sense of power, power struggle. Now in this poem, I feel like she feels really powerful. So she has control over her memory. And that links to me to poems like Ozymandias or even My Last Duchess, where they also feel that they have power and control. But in Ozymandias, it's kind of an ironic power and control, isn't it? Because he ends up um, waste. Well, his statue ends up wasting away and he ends up dead and unknown. Um, whereas in here, we get the sense that that power and that control is still there for her anyway. Uh, but I guess you could argue it's an ironic power because she's not at the place anymore. 
The great thing about this poem, though, is that arguably you can link it to most of them in the collection, which is why it's a really good one to know for the identity group. Um, OK, hopefully that was useful. Um, any questions about the poem, feel free to let me know and um, see you next time.